Can you hear me better now? All right. Um, so in, in terms of what we focus on, um, we tend to favor the open source stacks, the, the solar, the elastic search. This meetup was founded with Elastic being there, talking about an earlier version of their product. Um, I'm hopeful in the next meetup, we're actually gonna bring their team in again, and we're gonna be talking about some of the later uh, and newer features that they now offer. Um, in terms of the format tonight, um, it's really going to be pretty much what we typically do. There'll be two talks. Uh, tonight, we're gonna choose to run them pretty much one after the other, so about 30 minutes each for the talks. Uh, feel free if you've got questions that you'd like to uh, ask the speakers. Uh, this is meant to be interactive, something you can learn from. Um, before I continue, I do want to thank the folks from Wayfair. This is just an awesome location, and thank you so much for hosting. Thank you for the food. Really appreciate you doing that. All right, time to get on script. Um, in terms of what we've got for speakers tonight, um, John's going to kick us off with Wayfair's query intent engine. We're going to understand a bit more about how they go about this topic of query intent. Uh, I've seen it discussed in many conferences. There's lots of challenges to trying to discern what a user is trying to locate when they execute a search. So they're going to be covering that from Wayfair's perspective. Uh, and then Suyash is going to talk to us a bit about the, uh, the event-driven data pipeline for search. So um, they've got a Spark stack here. You're going to learn a bit about how they're working uh, with those data pipelines. And as I said, it's meant to be uh, somewhat collaborative here in terms of a question and answer format. So feel free to ask those speakers uh, if you have questions. Um, before we go any further, does anyone have any announcements? Uh, this is a great time. If there's any other technology event you know that's going on that you'd like to highlight, if you've got openings for jobs, uh, there are technical people here. Feel free to uh, talk about them as well. Any events? Yes. Perfect. Thank you for that. Anybody else? All right. Um, my plan is to take a couple of months. Everyone enjoys these summer months, so we're going to do that. I'll probably line up the next meetup for September. And uh, the goal right now is, is to work with our friends over at Elastic on a talk that will center itself around that stack. Okay? So I'm going to turn it over to Mark, and he's going to talk a bit about Wayfair and the Search Tech Stack. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to Wayfair. Uh, so we're really excited here to host our first meetup uh, at Wayfair for the Search Technologies Group uh, in what seems like a very, very long time. So it's pretty exciting for us. Uh, to introduce myself, my name is Mark Canning. Uh, I've been at the company for, uh, since 2008. Uh, I've worked on various teams uh, in my time here, and I joined the Search Technologies team about a year ago. I was really excited to join the team because I've worked here for a while. I've seen what the team has done at Afar. I've been pretty interested in the space, and I jumped at the chance to really join the team uh, and be part of, of the team that's really powering the growth of this company. Uh, so to give you a little background on Wayfair, the company was established in 2002. Uh, we branded ourselves as Wayfair uh, in 2011 and then went public in 2014. Uh, before branding ourselves as Wayfair, we actually were called CSN Stores. Uh, we were a series of microsites, so hundreds of microsites. It's called things like racks and stands and all teakfurniture.com and things like that. And we kind of used those, those sites to sell furniture, but they were all branded under what we called CSN stores. Uh, and right now, we're actually closing in on 20,000 employees worldwide, so it's pretty exciting. Um, uh, we're an e-commerce company at heart. We have sold everything from uh, TV stands, dining sets, uh, boats at one point, coffins for a little while, which was a little weird. Uh, and this was actually one of the first iterations of our search experience at, uh, at Wayfair. So it was CSN stores. You can see on the right, if you can read that code, what's actually happening there is that's, that's classic ASP. We are tokenizing uh, a search term by spaces and then running a SQL query to find everything that exists with those words. So we've come a little bit of ways since then. 
Uh, we've, been, we've been working for quite a while. Uh, to give you a sense of the current sort of landscape of what Wayfair is, as a company is, uh, we are operating eight stores, uh, Wayfair, Joss Main, All Modern, Birch Lane, Paragold, and then Wayfair in multiple countries, uh, four countries to be precise. Uh, we have about 10 million products that we sell on our site, and we get about 2 million daily visitors. Uh, so Search uh, adopted solar in 2009. Uh, with the entire team uh, in the engineering department numbered under about 100 people, and this was at the time, about 2009, uh, there was one person who actually managed our solar uh, cluster. Well, it wasn't really a cluster, it was just one index, and it broke pretty much every single day. Uh, so while managing the platform that powers the entire site, this team built massive game-breaking capabilities like predictive search, uh, so the smaller sub-features within that, like drill downs, related trending searches, uh, visual search, and many more over the years. This team's been pretty active at conferences. Uh, we presented last year at the Activate conference. Uh, John and Suyash actually did. They presented uh, Waymoji, which is our system for gathering sentiment data from customer reviews and then using it to power uh, relevance on our keyword search. Uh, so here's a little bit of the search by the numbers to, get you a to give you a sense of the scale that we're operating at right now. We get about 2.5 million search sessions per day. Uh, about evenly distributed between desktop and mobile, and then a little bit less uh, on our app. We get about 300,000 to 600,000 solar queries per minute, and sometimes that can jump up uh, during periods of pretty high load. Like during Way Day, we had some areas of the day where we got above 2 million records or 2 million queries within a minute. So it was, it was pretty exciting to actually see that happen in our site not fall over. Uh, we also get about 700,000 uh, predictive clicks per day. Uh, to give you a sense of the infrastructure that we're running, our solar cluster uh, has a, a little bit over a thousand nodes. Uh, we have 85 million documents, about 12 million products across all the eight stores, and we manage this acro across about 100 collections. Uh, this set of collections receives about 100 million document rights per day. Suyash is going to go into a little bit of depth on how we actually accommodate that that load of data pipeline uh, activity, and we're in a hybrid cloud model, so not in a, a traditional sense of a hybrid cloud, but we have a infrastructure in Google Cloud and we have an infrastructure in our on-prem data centers and we serve traffic uh, between those two sets uh, pretty seamlessly right now. So uh, in addition to the challenges of scale, we've had to provide search capabilities uh, to customers who expect seamless interaction with the websites they visit. Customers of Wayfair expect us to be able to quickly understand what they want through a somewhat ambiguous search phrase and instantly provide relevant, personalized results from our catalog to them. I should note we're hiring pretty aggressively to continuously push the boundaries and what we can do in this space. We're partnering with our data science team to really figure out how we can improve the sort uh, and get really great results to our customers. In addition to that, we're, we're also looking to expand our capabilities on the infrastructure side. Uh, we're looking to automate cluster management, our CI, CD pipeline, and partner well with our infrastructure teams to build out our, our capabilities to manage search, not just as, as a platform for search, but as a service to every team at Wafer really looking to, to utilize text search within their applications. Uh, so on the uh, customer interaction front, I'd like to bring up John, who will talk about how we diagnose customer intent. All right, I also have some notes here for my first few slides. Afterwards, I won't look at them and I'll just wing it. All right, so I'm John, hi everyone. I'm a senior software engineer here at Wayfair. I've been on the search, search technologies team here at Wayfair for about three years now. I worked on a, nearly all aspects of our tech stack, going from data pipeline, uh, getting all the product updates from databases and different data sources to solar and a customer as fast as we can. I worked on a lot of the automation tool work that we use to manage all of our clusters, things like uh, rebalancing clusters across different nodes and different data centers around the world, doing it as best we can to uh, balance the load for our customers. And I've also worked on uh, more front end uh, applications like search suggestions, uh, predictive uh, type of searches in, get suggestions back, uh, trying to give customers some ideas of what to search for after it gives us a few characters. And I've also done some work, like what uh, Mark mentioned before, uh, 
processing product reviews to get more information about how customers themselves, what words they use to describe our products, because we often don't know uh, what products are cute or fluffy in our product catalog. So using that information to uh, improve search relevance on keyword pages. Now I've uh, finished introducing myself. We'll go over a bit about what to expect. So I'll spend some time talking about uh, all the ways that we use or query intent to help customers figure out uh, what, where they want to go on our website. So we use some uh, tools like search suggestions to kind of uh, guide them in the right direction. And we use all different information and signals to curate those suggestions we show them. And uh, we'll start talking about uh, all the different technologies that uh, this team is responsible for and how we use query intent to kind of uh, personalize and curate the results that we show customers. And then we'll spend some time uh, going through a few lightning rounds, showing screenshots of all the different features. I'll try to describe those a little bit. And uh, yeah, any more questions after the screenshots you can ask. And we'll spend some time talking about uh, two technologies a little bit more in depth, uh, spell checking and our search classifier. And then, uh, yeah, let's get into it. So, after, uh, if there's anything I miss at the end, uh, we'll talk about that too. All right, so in, in brief, uh, navigational search, what is it? The main responsibility is for navigational search is to get customers to the right place after they enter a search bar. We don't really care about what products they see after we redirect them, just get them to the right place on our website. Uh, there are a lot of different places customers can go to on our website. We have, uh, if you ever went to a website, there's like browse pages, uh, just curated, uh, not curated, but a more homogeneous uh, class of products. And then we have uh, pages where we don't really know what customers want. So we kind of mix in different product classes together. And then we have things like product sale pages where there's a flash sale event or a wayday event page and curating the sales events for those products. Then we also have uh, pages on our website that aren't products like uh, customer service pages, credit card information pages, and so on. So uh, the, the main parts of this I want to talk about are highlighted here. So let's uh, go over that a bit. So uh, we're focusing on navigational search. One of the other kinds of searches that complement this in the uh, e-commerce space is transactional searches or informational searches. So transactional searches are usually more uh, invested in Show, figuring out what product to show you for your search phrase. We don't care about that. We only want to get you to the right place. And how do we do that? Well, when a customer starts entering search, like we have here, uh, chairs, right? There's so many chairs, which chair? What specifically what chair? So we don't really know what chairs customers are searching for. If they're new customers, we have no information about them. So we try to use information that other customers have uh, shared with us. So here it's like a, a aggregate uh, data of all customers who type in chairs. But we want to kind of uh, personalize these results more, get more customer context, more context not specific to customers, uh, maybe information about seasons. Or if we do know that a customer is logging to a website and they may be, be uh, personal shopping for their homes, residential uh, purchases, there could be instances where a customer is not uh, shopping for residential, could be a B2B customer. And in those cases, we can't exactly personalize search experiences very well because a customer who's shopping for a business, they may be shopping in bulk for one of their clients one day and another day shopping for something else. So we want to figure out how do we uh, augment or provide variants of our search experiences quickly for, for specific sets of uh, uh, searches. So that's where we go into uh, some concepts called uh, multi-armed bandit. Um, and hopefully that'll give us some uh, more advantages to tune our search suggestions for that. Uh, so now let's give us uh, an example, table lamps. So that's pretty easy search, at least for us to figure out what customers wanted to go. Uh, it's only two words, and fortunately, we can do some lexical search on it, the straight substring matching in our product catalog, and that maps pretty directly to a uh, class in our product catalog. So we show them table lamps here. Now, uh, let's say if it's not that easy, we need, still need to figure out 
what to show customers if they search for horse lamps. So we have a lot of different kinds of lamps at Wayfair. We have floor lamps, table lamps, outdoor lamps, 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 lamps everywhere. So when someone searches for this large indoor horse lamp, it's uh, pretty tough to figure out what exactly to show customers, even where to send them. So fortunately, we do some processing uh, for a classifier, a logistic regression classifier that we train over uh, a course of days. And we figure out what this actually means. So we have a service that's sitting uh, behind every uh, enter on the keyword search bar. This service figures out what is the likelihood that what you search for relates to what product class we have. So in the cases where we can't apply a hard filter in our back end solar, uh, that's the dream if you can apply hard filters for everything because then we, their search results will be really good. Uh, we kind of have to uh, accommodate that with uh, just boosts on the keyword results page. So the, uh, the magnitude of the boost kind of correlates to the confidence in our classifier that when you say horse lamps, we uh, understand you mean table lamps. And here's a few unicorn problems. So when uh, someone starts ter ser searching for a unicorn, uh, it's I, even I don't know what people want when they search for a unicorn. So uh, it's really difficult relative to before. Uh, we rely on historical data. When customers search for something, what do they click on, essentially? And we train our uh, machine learning algorithms to figure out and suggest uh, probability is that they want these products or these classes. So we know that uh, when customers search for that, we have a few products on the left and we have a class on the right. Uh, top sellers for unicorn and the confidence that they search for wall art decor. But we it goes beyond that. Uh, there's a few things that we generate, uh, uh, we relate different phrases to others, like multi-word synonyms. So if we know that customers search for one thing and they search for something else, uh, we call that like keyword reformulations. So if customers uh, search for one word, they go to a result page, they didn't like it, it was horrible, they never clicked anything, then right away they click, they search for something else. We start to uh, relate those two, saying customers, uh, they enter this, maybe it was misspelling, maybe what they searched for was a word we didn't understand. So they try to refine it themselves. And then we figure out these uh, relations. So here, uh, when we customer types bowl chair, we know that they actually mean pathosan chair. And then we send that other information to our keyword result page. And we say, we're pretty sure that even though they type bowl chair, they mean this, so show those products higher in the result page. Uh, those were a few examples. Now, this is all the domain space that uh, this team is responsible for. And we're going to be talking about spell checking, query intent, and that's it going forward. So here's the uh, flow diagram of the main processes that happen after you hit enter on a search bar. So there's some pretty basic stuff here, like uh, we do some text processing, we tokenize stem, remove soft words, collapse accents, and uh, do some uh, removal of words that, uh, domain specific words that Wayfair considers soft words. So we do all that, we get make sure all the search strings are cleaned, they're pretty normalized now. So if a customer searches for something else and they miss a letter, it will still be mapped back to the same phrase. And then uh, for business rules, we have uh, administrators are able to uh, tell us what they want specific phrases to redirect to or specific some substrings to redirect to. So we have to handle that. Um, not very exciting there. But uh, afterwards, we start getting into some lexical search uh, matching. So that's why I talked to you a little earlier. Uh, we have, fortunately, a lot of labeled data, a lot of data that we can easily train models over. So. Because of that, we know pretty plainly if someone searched for table lamps, they mean table lamps class. And But if we can't find that out, just uh, text matching, we have to fall back to, uh, before we go to the classifier, uh, make sure or check, confirm that they did not misspell a word or not. 
Then after that, if all else fails, you pull back to our classifier, and that's where we use uh, historical data to figure out the customer search or something, what do they usually uh, go after in product results. So spell checking, how does it work? So here's an example, uh, wood bedrooms sets. Uh, we spell check it back to wood bedrooms, and then we uh, normalize it down to removing uh, pluralization, et cetera, to wood bedroom sets. And unfortunately, we know it matches to uh, category bedroom sets and wood attribute filter checked off. Here's how it would look on a results page. Uh, all this filtering, it could be more complex, so we can detect a lot more filters involved in the keyword page or any page. So here an example, we know the uh, dimension size, we know colors, we know the uh, brand name, and we know it's a rug. And it's an example of a rule to redirect that we have to support for customer service. And all the information we do, we also support a few languages. Here's an example in French. Uh, the main difference here, there's a lot more accents we need to uh, fold and get rid of. And for German, uh, the main uh, difficulty for German is there's a lot of uh, compound words. So a lot of uh, words that we normally spit with white, white spaces, uh, German people like to uh, bring them together into one long string, not traditional white space limited. So we need to figure out what different words are in that word. And then after we do that, do the same treatment we do as any other language, uh, we tokenize it, remove all the soft words, et cetera, and try and figure out how we mask back to a product catalog. Uh, now we'll talk a little bit about uh, spell checking. So spell checking is uh, not, it's not easy. If, uh, if you're doing like a dictionary search, this Boolean, is this misspelled or not? It kind of is easy, but for search, we need to suggest proper spellings for words or else we couldn't you know, do well, every time that someone misspells something, we get bad results. So we need to uh, do the correction for them. Uh, here's something, here's a little bit of it about how we do that. Uh, we make use of the SimSpell uh, library. This, we use this to generate candidates for all the nodes in this graph below. So we use a lot of our history, uh, search history for that and keyword reformulations. What this tells us is when customers, I mentioned earlier, if someone searches for, um, let's say, My Little Pony, and they get results because it's all properly spelled, but someone then searches for MLP, and we don't get results because we don't understand what that means. So if someone searches for MLP, and then they search for My Little Pony after, we kind of know that maybe MLP should be corrected to My Little Pony spelling. So. That example, we know that there's some changes that you can make to all the characters in the search phrase. So we say, how many uh, character edits would it take to transform My Little Pony back to MLP? So then we, we look at how many searches over time customers search for MLP and My Little Pony. And then we start conducting uh, probabilities that My Little Pony or My maps back to M and we start generating uh, graphs like that. So how many times does M appear in a search history alone, et cetera, et cetera? So here on the, on the graph, we see green, gray, ren. We can also have G-R-E-N, G-R-N, et cetera. Uh, we know green is the correct spelling, but you see from the example G-R-E-N, there's only one character edit away. That's a character deletion. So we know that single character deletion, we know that green appears a lot in our search history, and we know that uh, er there's a lot more occurrences in our search history of accent given green before it. So we just try to uh, transition different states on this graph. So the probability of transitioning from green to accent given uh, green before, it's a 0 0.07 uh, probability of that. And we just keep uh, trying to find the highest probability a path in the graph. And that's how we get a spelling uh, correction. Uh, the algorithm to actually traverse the graph to find the great, the best, most likely path is the Fortelby algorithm. Uh, it's pretty, people can probably explain it better on YouTube videos and stuff than me. But, um, okay, after we have that, uh, we also have our classifier. So, we use a logistic regression classifier that's trained over 30 days of data. And 
all of our data, we know we have a, a click stream data. So when someone searches for something and then they click on another product, we try and uh, we ma have that mapping. And then now we have a mapping of products. We can figure out what classes uh, that mapping is. So now we have a data set of features of search phrases, products, product classes, usually for uh, search in our uh, e-commerce space. They're mostly concerned with uh, classes of products to get a pretty homogeneous data set. And then from there, you can you know, order your product on best selling and, or whatever else, delivery and, and et cetera. So once we get the uh, correct product uh, classes for a search phrase, uh, we serve that up to customers. Uh, this is a, uh, a multinomial uh, log logistic regression uh, model. So instead of giving us binary yes or no, it gives us probabilities that whatever you search for is some value likelihood that it's this class or that class or any other class. So now uh, with the classifier, we have great search phrase that we can't figure out um, off the pure text, how it maps back to a product catalog. We have some confidence, some probability that this phrase is this product class. We have a lot of different um, teams at Wayfair. Uh, a lot of data scientists, after we give them the correct product class, we apply a hard filter on that. After we apply a, part, a hard filter on, let's say, table lamps, uh, we hand off to that team or whatever other team manages that page to figure out the correct ordering of the products. And because I didn't have enough time to create a cool uh, animation, we have this that I found online. So it's, uh, imagine this uh, curve, is, we're trying to fit it to the data points that we have, and it's uh, working. <laughs> um, so here's the, uh, some shortcomings of uh, what I talked about. I mentioned that we have uh, different teams that work on the ordering of different products and different pages. We have many different pages, uh, event pages, uh, keyword search pages, uh, browse pages. Some have hard filters, some have, don't have hard filters. Different kinds of data for different purposes. And Mark said even more use cases with other teams trying to develop their own uh, internal tools like career search and whatever. They're trying to use our tech to power that. So perfect example of My Little Pony MLP. Uh, we different teams. So navigational search, we're not, we don't care about the product we show. Uh, other team uh, relevance in search tech, we would care about what products we show for those queries that we can apply a hard filter. So taking that, you see here, when I start typing My Little Pony, uh, you get, you know, suggestion for My Little Pony because everything's, you know, nice and kosher, everything's spelled correctly, and a lot of customers search for it. But when I start typing MLP, I don't get anything back. So there's uh, still some advantages of uh, sharing information and contextual information, uh, multi-word synonyms that we don't use in navigation that we use on to uh, uh, order the products on our keyword search result pages. And a lot, may, there's a lot of other uh, opportunities here that we have not yet acknowledged or are willing to work with you guys and uh, join our team. We'll help figure it out together. And I think now I'm done. And now it's uh, Suyesh, unless anyone else has quick questions. Yep. I think we wanted to give you a mic, so uh, we're recording, so the recording has Sorry. your question also. Uh, oh. uh, so, yeah, my question was about the quality of the data itself. Um, like, is it all owned by Wayfair or is it third party? Because, like, hard filters are great, but if you're using third party data or whatever, where the sources aren't always trustworthy, then applying a hard filter adds a lot of risk to that because a filter is only as good as the data you're filtering against. Yep. Uh, so good question. Fortunately, um, at least uh, for us, we know everything about our product catalog and we have teams of uh, merchandisers to uh, figure it out for us and suppliers also supply that information. So our product catalog uh, data is pretty clean. Uh, so we don't rely on, I guess the only third party information we rely on is the ones that suppliers give us. 
and after it goes through some quality checks, um, it ends up on our website. Uh, but we do have systems that don't rely on product catalog data. Uh, the project that uh, Mark mentioned before, uh, we use customer reviews, so very unstructured text. And we figure out uh, what words customers use to describe products that we don't get. Because a lot of them, we can't possibly apply a hard filter on Fluffy. Because, you know, what is Fluffy or cute, right? So uh, those, those instances where we are not confident enough, or I guess if we don't rely on a product catalog data, we don't apply a hard filter. Instead, we boost. And the boost may be pretty strong. But uh, again, once you get to the uh, actual results on that, on, of the page that you see, it's up to them to figure out what the right mix of products is for your strong boost and maybe introducing some variants in the product results you see. So it's not always only one thing of what you think is right. Are you getting? Are you getting? Are you giving a different search result whether the user is logged in or not the way Google has it? Yeah. Uh, so we we do have some personalization uh, on the order of products on our result pages, and it's it is also dependent on whether you're logged in or not. Uh, if you're a new like a new user or activated users, there's different sort algorithms that we sort on to get you the products. Uh, they're usually like uh, best selling products or products that best sell in your area or things like that. Uh, so quick question, you were talking about the signal information that you were capturing and having that inform your models. I was curious, you said um, you were using 30 days of historical data. Had you tried with longer periods of time? Did that have any impact, yes or no? I'm facing a similar problem right now, so I'm curious about it. And then also, are you using other types of signal information like people who actually bought products um, to also inform that? Yes. Um, so we only use 30 days right now because the volume of our data is very large and it takes a very long time to come to run through everything. So we had to limit it at 30 days. Um, but after that, uh, it's very not amazing features that we use from our history. Like basic ones, uh, you just first search volume for one. Uh, after we uh, collapse like phrases, I could do a lot of stemming and things like that to make sure that uh, bedroom sets and bedroom set, they're counted as the same thing. Uh, and there's a lot of uh, cleaning up of the data that we have to do, uh, removing like swear words and uh, competing company names and things like that. Uh, then after that, we have uh, some just simple metrics. Uh, how many times do customers you know click on this product after they search for something? Um, uh, yeah, I think I'm short on time. Or... Yep. Yeah, just a question. Um, so I mentioned tokenization in your query intent engine. This is a fairly well-solved problem in the, the Solar and Lucene communities. Are you leveraging the Lucene analyzers for your multi-language tokenization, word decompounding, stemming, uh, ASCII folding, all that fun stuff? Yep, uh, so this the query intent, it's a Right now we have it as a separate web service. So we have to implement a lot of the things that solar, like we can, uh, like different solar plugins, like for uh, accent uh, folding and, uh, what's that? Um, the uh, splitting of words, like for German, uh, compound splitting. We make use of nearly all of those uh, with slightly modified for uh, once we redirect customers to those pages. So uh, the same things happen in two places right now, unfortunately. So on this side where a customer hasn't been shown products yet, we have to do a lot of the same steps. Uh, so we're, now we're implementing basically our own data structure to search over and all the different pre-processing done beforehand. After a customer gets taken to a keyword result page or yeah, keyword result page, we have to do the same stuff. We make uh, use of the standard solar plugins for that mostly. So we are making use of that. Um, it's just not in the navigation side. Cool, thanks. Thank you. And, and now, so yes. Um, and, and just to uh, continue his answer, uh, I think uh, uh, the decision to use this sort of inbuilt plugins on solar side is uh, 
you have to decide like what you want to do at indexing versus at the search time. So most of the stuff that we use for solar indexing time is, uh, sorry, uh, the solar plugins that we use are mostly used at index time. And all the stuff that you want to do at the query side Im impacts performance. So you just want to make it like a separate service and don't want to load solar machines with that. I was just curious if you had any you know, differences in the algorithms, the implementation, subtle differences in tokenization can leave you scratching your head sometimes. Yeah, there, there are some issues you're right about it. All right. Uh, so uh, my name is Suyash Sonamne. Uh, I've been working with Wayfair for about four years now. Uh, I'm going to talk about data ingestion. Uh, so before that, um, I'll just give a little bit background of uh, uh, when I started a search uh, about in 2015. Um, we were sort of a, a small team of people basically working on everything that's search related. So everyone was a master of everything. Um, and uh, if you look at what typically people uh, expect when they come to work at search is like they want to work on national processing, they want to work on relevance, they want to work on machine learning. So this is exactly what I wanted to work on. And uh, uh, over the time we realized that our big, uh, like there are other problems within search that uh, you also have to address. And uh, out of that, we uh, I think recently we split our teams into smaller teams uh, and each individually started focusing on different areas. Uh, and I picked up the team called as uh, Data Pipeline Team. Uh, uh, and I'm going to explain what problem it solves. Uh, but if you're if you're working with search for a long time, or if you uh, happen to work at e-commerce uh, in uh, e-commerce search, you'll know what I'm talking about very uh, easily. Uh, but I think this is a problem that uh, uh, is something that I haven't seen many people talk about uh, with re with respect to search. Uh, so let's see if uh, I hope this talk will be helpful if you are facing the similar problems. Uh, so first of all, uh, why we care about data ingestion at scale, right? Uh, so basically, if your data ingestion is all not sorted out, uh, you essentially end up with uh, stale data on your website. So stale data means, uh, it totally means like just bad customer experience. Uh, your price is gonna be wrong, your uh, out of stock status can be wrong, and every wrong item can result into a unique bad experience for customer. And customer just send you that those pissed off emails that I ordered something and then you canceled it because it was not in stock. So uh, I think all these issues matter a lot, uh, especially uh, when it comes to customer experience. And these are the experience that we don't typically associate with search, but search is kind of indirectly uh, affecting these experiences. So it is really important that we look at this problem seriously. And I want to tie the, the data freshness problem very close to search. I came up with this diagram, I just made it up, that if you want to build an awesome search, uh, like most of the time we care about showing relevant result and, and we think that it's done, but that's not the complete picture. Uh, you also have to have fast response. If you can give me really relevant result, but if your query takes like one minute, people probably will just like shut down their browser, right? Um, and let's say if the result is very relevant and it is really fast, but all the data is incorrect, it's stale, it's the same thing, right? So if you look at all three things together, that's what, if you, if you can um, make everything um, as expected, that's when you can say that, you know, your search is really awesome. Uh, so fresh data is what I'm gonna talk about. Um, so when it comes to data ingestion as solar uh, at scale, uh, this, is, this is what I imagine that there are a bunch of data sources, some are databases, some are uh, services, some are files, like there are different type of data sources. And then um, you have some kind of a ETL pipeline going on and, and that puts data into solar, right? But if you Google data ingestion at scale, what you see is like people talk about collection configs, uh, solar server configs, and client side tuning. Like how to do GC tuning on solar, how to um, uh, uh, change your merge factor, hard soft commit, doc values, batched updates, and everything. These all things are great, and they definitely make uh, 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 they, they definitely improve the performance of solar, but this is everything that you do once your data reaches solar, right? So what about the stuff, like how can you get your data to reach from your source to solar faster? Once it reaches solar, you, you, there is a plenty, plenty of stuff available online to sort of know how to optimize uh, indexing part of solar, but I'm gonna talk about, not about these, but about um, how to create that ETL pipeline efficiently 
um, to get the solar to data from your source to solar faster. Um, and in terms of Wayfair, uh, when I say e-commerce search data, I'm this is just a sort of an example of what kind of data we index in our solar uh, solar index. Uh, we have about more than 200 fields that we store for each document, and each document is a SKU. Uh, and uh, uh, the way Wayfair has been, like, it's, if you if you know the history of Wayfair, Mark just said that we were founded in 2002. At that time, it was mostly ASP, .NET, and uh, we were sort of running in this mode where uh, uh, the speed wins every time. So um, when I came in, uh, uh, and even in uh, now to a certain extent, most of the stuff is stored in database. Uh, and that means uh, we have individual database for storing inventory information, product catalog information, pricing, and there are 10 more databases I can show, show over here. So what makes it really challenging is that um, this data is stored in different databases, and now you want to fetch it from all, all those places and put it into your solar index, and you have to keep doing this. And if you look at just the volume of updates, uh, we get like billions of updates every month, and I think it's about more than three billion, so it's about mil more than 100 million per day. Uh, uh, if you know the modern pricing algorithms, they change price of millions of items overnight multiple times. Uh, that's just like only maybe 20% of our volume. Um, so in terms of uh, uh, the data that we are talking about, it's coming from multiple sources. So the way we, uh, in the beginning, when we started with search team, uh, the way we did uh, uh, data indexing was sort of create, write a big stored procedure. Uh, and before that, we basically create a data, another database called a solar database, which has all the tables that we need from different places replicated into it. And then we had our own tables. So we created a separate database instance to uh, sort of create like a one place for storing all the data we need so that we can run this giant stored procedure, uh, like a few thousand lines worth of stored procedure uh, to join all those tables together and do some sort of pre-processing on each. Uh, and you can imagine like uh, it wasn't really uh, giving us any speed. Like I think at that time we were used, we were, uh, we can at, at max do one or two full updates every day. And uh, if you're working in e-commerce, that's definitely not, not what you want. But uh, I think, uh, maybe five or six years ago, uh, it was fine for Wayfair. But the, we soon realized that this is something that's not gonna work. Uh, so we went to incremental indexing. So th basically the difference is that you sort of store the current snapshot of the data and then track what changed and you only uh, process what's, uh, what's changed. So it kind of gives you a very fast track way of only getting updates. Like uh, if you have one million SKUs, only 100,000 SKUs changed, you don't need to recompute all your one million SKUs, you only have to essentially track what changed. So that worked uh, really nicely for us for, for a long period of time. Um, it, it, uh, it made uh, debugging issues a little difficult because uh, now you have multiple snapshots of intermediate steps that come from different places and all the intermediate calculations are stored in different tables. Uh, but then it was sort of a compromise that we made to, uh, to get the updates really fast into solar, especially things such as, which are very time sensitive, such as pricing and, and sale events. Um, but then the side effect of that was, uh, since we are creating this additional data, and all the data that we uh, extra, uh, write uh, into those extra tables, uh, you, that means you also uh, end up using your, increasing your temp, temp database usage on your SQL server. Um, so as Wayfair scaled, we had more and more product and more and more traffic that soon started becoming a problem that uh, incremental uh, data, uh, the volume of the delta within a small uh, period of time started getting larger and larger. And that means um, since everything was getting processed at the same time, uh, there was no way to say uh, if there is something that is high priority uh, should get processed before the something that was low priority or not. So the next step that we did was we come up with a uh, priority queue system, again, in database. Uh, so we create a database-based queue, uh, which essentially held the uh, data tagged with priority. And uh, this was kind of nice because uh, you can say which is a high priority update and which is a low priority update. But then we soon realized that this is not going to work the way we expect because sometimes a high priority update can keep flowing in and it will forever stall the low priority update behind it. 
So we sort of tuned it and said, okay, let's make it like a hybrid priority queue so that we also have a time limit uh, so that no nothing waits longer than a uh, certain time and it gets processed within that uh, time for sure. So this, these are just like arbitrary numbers uh, just to give you an idea of how it looks like. Uh, this, this went on for a while. Uh, this worked really well. Uh, this is just a snapshot of how it actually happens. Uh, different color here indicates different source of data with a different priority. So if you look at this, the purple color has a higher priority, uh, uh, sorry, the yellow color has a higher priority than the purple color, and the, pur uh, the purple has a higher priority than the, um, the blue color. So blue update wait until all the purples are done, but when it reaches its expiry time, you start getting uh, process on both ways. So this sort of gave us uh, some improvement over the previous system, but then that means we were now storing even more data into the same database, and we had to implement jobs and stored procedures to sort of manage the uh, data movement through this queue, uh, and then that means uh, when the volume of updates increased, uh, one process, one stored procedure is processing a lot more data than uh, that we designed it for. And that means there was a lot of blocking, uh, deadlocks, and there was a time then we realized that we were doing something wrong uh, and we need to change our approach. Uh, this is just a snapshot of uh, what it looked like on the database server. Uh, you may be not able to see the scale here, but this is in seconds, and the topmost is 80,000 seconds. So that's how much it, the wait uh, for certain jobs was. Um, and this is the life expectancy of pages. If you understand how databases work internally, uh, continuous drop means uh, you basically are reloading your cache on the database side every time. The, the pages that you loaded in your memory are not uh, uh, getting reused. So you basically delete everything and load them again. So this is, if you ideally want to see like more continuous line there. Uh, so this was essentially causing all the bottleneck on our side. The, so if you notice the pattern, uh, what was the problem? The DB-based focus of solving, like thinking that all the solutions lie in DB was the reason behind this. So we thought, how can we, how can we make it better? Um, and with, uh, that's when we started looking at alternate solutions, like uh, what is the basic problem here? We can create probably one more incremental incrementally better system to handle everything in DB, but what if we get rid of the database? But then it's a scary concept because uh, you have everything, your true copy in database, how can you get rid of it? So uh, I think just because everything in Wayfair was database, we were sort of getting blinded by that fact that the database is the source, but if you think a little more, the source is the actual service. The service makes the change and then writes into the database. So service has the, the, the service, which is basically doing the business com computations and uh, uh, calculating different values of uh, what is changed in the stock. It has the latest information, and then it writes into database. So can we create a, uh, like, uh, can you remove the dependency between uh, the data, different databases, get rid of the data replication, and try to create a shortcut from the service directly into solar? and use some kind of intermediate step in between, but we were not sure what that step would be. So uh, this is a, a sort of a common pattern that uh, started looking at uh, uh, solutions about like how other people are solving this problem, and the, the name Kafka popped up. Uh, we have been using that for uh, uh, moving data uh, from database to solar earlier, but then we never try to use it directly to plug in between the, the service itself and solar. So the pattern is that um, how do you ensure that the Kafka has up-to-date data is that when the service uh, creates a change event, uh, it writes the change data into database, and when it confirms that the write is successful, it's gonna also publish that change event onto the Kafka queue. So that means you create a stream of change events on Kafka and then uh, it is inconsistent with the uh, what what you have in the database. Uh, there are there are other issues with this. Like if you are familiar with this, you will know that there is a cold start problem. That like who, when you start with something already in the database, how do you get everything into Kafka? But but there are different ways to solve it. I'm not going to go into that. Um, but this is just one pattern of uh, how can you directly connect Solar to uh, uh, your data source. 
uh, and I haven't still talked about what will get your data from Kafka to solar, because the problem is not as simple as it looks in this diagram. Um, then another pattern is like, uh, obviously like if you have, typically you have more than one data sources. In e-commerce, I think we have about 20, 25 sources of data uh, coming from different places. Uh, so shall we just create like Kafka topic from all those sources and just stream that into solar? Um, so if, if you took a look at the, uh, what technology can you use to fill up the gap here in this box? Uh, the, if you, I think the, the typical name that come to your mind are Kafka streaming, uh, Spark streaming. There are a bunch of other technologies like Flink, Samza, and Kafka Connect. Um, we sort of did like a, uh, like I think more than one year ago, we sort of started to look into these technologies and see which one is gonna be more fit for us. Uh, and then started doing like proof of concept around these. Uh, but then I quickly realized that these technologies are actually built for moving large chunks of data because they have distributed processing. Our problem was slightly different that the amount of data we had to process incrementally is not really huge that we need like a really distributed processing. Uh, but the challenge was that since the data is coming from different sources and those sources are producing at different rates, we needed a sort of a way to synchronize uh, the update, uh, so synchronize the, uh, uh, the data that is coming from different sources. And like I, to give you an example, uh, let's say you have a data stream for pricing and you have a data stream for product updates. So let's say you, you, uh, you change something on the product. Uh, you will see uh, that that update come through that stream, but the, the price for that product may change multiple times in that period. So in order to find uh, what was the product for which the price changed, you only have uh, the key, which is this queue, in your pricing data. So the pricing data will look like uh, here is a skew that changed, there is a new price. That's the event that you will see in the pricing stream. But in the product catalog, uh, you may not have the same product, uh, uh, same product giving you an update at the same time. So basically the updates for the same key are happening at different times. And if you're using streaming, uh, you really need a way to sort of store the state of that stream. This is a um, it's slightly new concept. Uh, uh, in, in, uh, I think I've seen this for the first time in Kafka that uh, it's, a, it's a concept of table versus stream. Uh, that table is a final snapshot of your data while stream is the history. So if you combine stream and, and if you want to represent a state uh, of what is the stream look like at this point, you essentially have, uh, uh, you essentially look at the, the values in the table, which is the current value of all the uh, records in the table as your snapshot. But as you go forward in the stream, you get more updates and your snapshot changes. So the final value of each unique record in a stream represents a state for the stream. So uh, think about uh, uh, the think about a scenario where you have 25 different streams of data coming from different places, uh, and you have to look for the unique key uh, in each stream to find out what is the other piece of data that I have uh, on, in this particular stream, so that you can join and create a full picture. But you may be wondering, why don't you use atomic updates? Because you have one data stream giving you product data, you have one data stream giving you uh, like inventory data, sale data, why don't we just update the, send the partial document to solar and just update it in place in solar? It looks like this is one of the solution we looked at, but if you remember uh, for atomic updates, there is one requirement that you have to have all of your fields as stored fields. Uh, but that means you have to uh, store a lot more data in your index and the yeah, we, we sort of started dropping uh, the requirement for having fields stored uh, earlier on because it gave us improvement in query performance. And it is also a recommended approach that you only make the fields uh, that you need to actually view as stored and everything else should be just indexed so that you can search on them, but you cannot view the data when you get this document from Solar back. So we didn't want to change that requirement. So atomic update was out of question here. Um, so all the solutions that I talked about, the uh, uh, Kafka streaming, uh, sorry, Kafka streaming, uh, uh, Spark streaming, uh, 
they have a concept of streaming join. Uh, but if you look closely to the API, uh, you have to specify a time window on a join. You cannot join on the whole history of the record because it's a data stream. To give you an example, like I'll go by the example which will be in the subsequent slides, that if you have a, uh, a click stream data coming in, and if you have a user activity in the other stream, uh, you have to specify a window of, let's say, one hour, uh, so that you can say, when the click stream data comes in, I expect the user ID to be in this stream within a period of one hour. So that only works uh, for data where you can define a, a finite time window. But if you try to apply this analogy to your product stream, uh, sorry, product catalog stream and pricing team, this may not work. Like you have, you may have a product that was added one year ago, but then you are changing the price of that product first time after one year. And if you try to look up the, the, the information about that product in the stream, it may not be there because you cannot specify infinite time window. So this was the exact problem that we had, that we cannot use Spark streaming to join our streams uh, due to the nature of the e-commerce data. Um, so what you need in order to do this, uh, the Spark streaming gives you a sort of a uh, add-on that, that is called as state storage. Uh, so that means each Spark instance running in the Spark cluster uh, can store the state locally so it's like a local uh, storage for key value lookup uh, for doing joins on different streams so that you can look up the even the values that changed like long time ago and, and you don't really have to um, worry about the window size here because the state is essentially all the records together with all the history. So the, the problem with this is that this is a local storage on in Spark cluster. So um, you, uh, if, you if, if your job fails or if your data gets corrupted, uh, if you have to rerun your job, you have to rebuild the state. And that can take a long time, and uh, that can introduce additional delays in your real-time processing. So this option we looked at, but we, we actually did not select this because of the same reasons that it has, um, uh, it is not really suitable uh, when the things really go wrong. And for e-commerce data, you need to have some kind of external uh, storage that is not attached to your Spark instance. Uh, and this is one more pattern that you can find on uh, the Confluent website about Kafka, that uh, there is this new API called as KSQL, uh, which, is, uh, which gives you an ability to join uh, data from two Kafka topics. Uh, but it also uses its own internal uh, state store, which is similar to the way Spark uses. So every time you have some, let's say your schema changes, you have to refresh all data in your Kafka queue. So that means you basically discard everything. You have to rebuild the state locally and then you, you continue from there onwards. And depending on your size of data, that process can take a very long time. And then you also lose more updates in that process because you're waiting for the state to get rebuilt. Um, and I already talked about Spark. Uh, so we decided to, we thought about like what exactly we need here, right? Uh, Spark and Kafka Connect gave us exactly what we need, but they didn't have all the features. So we didn't want to like build like an add-on on top of Spark because we did not really need the distributed computing uh, that Spark gives us. We just needed a way to sort of store the state in a fast, accessible manner. Uh, so what we did was we built a custom application uh, called Siphon, uh, which essentially is part Kafka Connect, part uh, uh, stream joining applications, uh, which you can basically add any number of Kafka topics uh, generated from the source. And then uh, whenever there is an update, you sort of have a distributed cache uh, where each uh, Kafka topic has its own sort of a separated area for storage. So let's say you have a, a source B, so you have a dedicated cache for source B where all your key values uh, will be stored. You have a, a another service and you can have another uh, cache dedicated to that instance. And that, uh, in that way, what happens is that your state store is now disconnected from your process. And we, I, I'm gonna show you like how, the, uh, how it looks like in real. So this is the actual uh, architecture that we are using now. Uh, there is a lot of going on, a lot of things going on here. So I want to start with the top. Um, so uh, each block in the top represents each data source. And I have only drawn like three data sources for simplicity. 
So what happens is that whenever the data changes in each service, like the product catalog or the inventory, they will push out a notification to the Kafka topic saying, okay, this changed. And in some cases, uh, the notification itself has the change data. And in some cases, the notification is only a key value that you can look up in some other service to get the actual data for. So this um, notification essentially acts as your real-time event stream that the Siphon application uh, is listening on. So the, all the green dots you see are the, the jobs that are running on our Siphon platform. Uh, and they are essentially just listening for the updates that are coming through uh, the Kafka stream. And then uh, depending on how you uh, get the data, this data is now getting cached into a distributed cache here. Uh, we chose to use Aerospike because that's, that's what Wafer uses. But I think you can easily use Redis for this or any other cache. And uh, if you look at the, the structure of this cache, uh, there are different sections for different data source. So what happens is that when you get a change event in product catalog, you don't have to worry about where you get the rest of the uh, fields for the documents from. You can just look it up in the cache. So, uh, so now uh, this join that you need in order to push the document into Solar, let's say you need 200 fields, right? And since these 200 fields are coming from different data source, you can, for simplicity, let's assume that each of these is giving you 50, 50, 50 fields each, and maybe the last one is giving you 100 fields. So let's say you get a partial update for 50 fields in this queue, then you look up the rest of the 150 fields in the cache so that you get the complete picture of the document, and then you publish the full document to Solar. So what happens is that you are no more reliant on other sources or the database to create the document uh, and, the, uh, and you, you can essentially get the remaining fields for the document in the cache itself. So this cache acts as sort of like a source of truth for your solar. And since there is like an independent channel going towards this cache from each source, these sources are updating on their own without having to worry about whether other sources are changing or not. Um, and then what happens is that whenever you write data into cache, uh, each service, uh, sorry, each job is also writing into another notification topic, uh, uh, which is uh, uh, and another siphon job, which we call as uh, uh, the published job, is listening to this uh, Kafka topic so that what it does is that when it says, okay, something changed. So what it does is that just looks at the key of the record, creates the full document by joining the data from all the different sections of the cache and pushes it into solar cloud. So now what happens is that now everything is just instantaneous, right? Uh, there are other issues like you have to address in the beginning that uh, how do you build up your cache? So that's like the cold start problem where uh, you have to like sort of load all your data into the cache first. But once the data is loaded, you're all set to go uh, and you, you can have almost real time updates. Now you're using this uh, architecture on part of our data. And the problem we are having right now is that uh, now earlier it used to be solar as our, uh, sorry, database as our bottleneck. Now it turns out that the solar is bottleneck now that the updates are getting to solar so fast that we have to, we are thinking of slowing them down so that solar doesn't fall over. So this is just a like, snapshot of uh, how the updates look like. Um, so the top two graphs uh, show data coming from two different sources. Are, it's read from Kafka. And uh, the bottom two show, this one shows the, the latency that we see while writing to solar. And this one shows the, the throughput of write that we get. Uh, so you see that the, the read is happening almost instantaneously. Uh, and the, uh, on the database side, the, the read is happening like within one minute in most cases. And then uh, we are able to publish to Solar on an average of about 10 seconds uh, for each batch update. And then the throughput that we get is about 2,000 two, 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 uh, two, two to 3,000 documents per second. And this is much higher than what we used to get earlier. But uh, when it goes to uh, like about 10 or something something beyond five to 10, uh, we recently saw that the solar starts falling over. So we need to do some additional tuning to so that solar can take so much uh, data update load on its side. So just to give you a recap of like how we went from like five years ago to now that uh, using different phases, we, was, we are slowly trying to in reduce the uh, average delay between the actual event of update into the how long it takes to uh, for the data to show up in solar, and I think for at least some part of data we are we are achieving like under one minute update time, 
and we try to push this even further going forward. And uh, the real challenge is going to be how we make 100% uh, data updates uh, on this on this new pipeline, so that we try to make this close to one minute for most of our updates on solar. That's it. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> so questions. <laughs> Your mic. One of the things with solar and all they're seeing is that once you flush it, when you do a comic, it, it flushes the, uh, the solar caches. So how how long does that take for you if you're doing incremental updates every uh, less than a minute? How, how uh, does that affect your cache warm-ups? So you're asking about how long it takes to warm the cache? Yes. Yeah, so, uh, so it, it happens in stages. Uh, if you just want to warm the cache uh, from all the historical data on Kafka, it takes seconds okay. uh, because Aerospike is really fast uh, and you can just read the Kafka topic very quickly. But if the source is database, uh, uh, because in some cases we have a queue between database and our application. Mm -hmm. uh, so database sort of takes its own time uh, to get the data from database. But once the, the data is available, it gets loaded into Kafka right away. Uh, and then um, after that, once it's, it's on Kafka, it's almost instantaneous to, uh, so I can give you an example of like, uh, it, it, the smallest store has about like 60,000 products on Wayfair. Uh, it took like uh, like five seconds to uh, refresh the cache for that. Okay. Thanks. So just one question, you're talking about your cache. Um, do you, oh, so to, to, to really parse the question, do you worry about the historical state of the joined information? Meaning that if you got a price update, and then you want to join that to product description, do you have to get the product description from a particular point in time, or are you just doing the current state of that product description? Yeah, so the cache always stores the latest copy. It's current uh, because state. it has, right. the product description is coming from a different data stream. Oh. So uh, it, is update, it is updating at its own rate. So whenever product description changes, it's just gonna update the copy in the cache. So if the pricing change comes first, uh, you might get one update with the stale product description in Solar, but as soon as the product description update comes in, it's gonna generate another change event and it will get give you the latest document in solar then. So, so in your cache, you're only keeping the current, the, the latest state? Right. Okay, because that would seem to be a lot more difficult if you were trying to do all the historical options for that. Right, right, right. Yeah. History, history is only on Kafka. Gotcha. So, so the other question, you know, the, the combination between Kafka and Spark Streaming seems like a you know, best in breed solution for this kind of problem. Um, but one of the challenges that I've seen has been around um, tracking. So how do you know um, if your update that you know, somehow made it onto the Kafka topic actually got through to solar? I'm just curious, how are you handling that now and are you seeing any issues with it? So we have uh, the tracking system for part of the data. Uh, like we have a acknowledgement uh, table in our database that, uh, so whenever the update moves through this pipeline, uh, it writes a, uh, we have another Kafka topic that we use for tracking. So what it does is it tracks, it, it just creates an event into that Kafka topic saying, okay, it moved through this step of the process. And then the tracker is essentially looking at all the events in the tracker topic. And whenever it sees that it went from end to end, it's just gonna write that acknowledgement back to database. So that when the next time you want to incremental change the database, it looks at which records have received that acknowledgement from the pipeline. And then it's just gonna give you the delta. Any other questions? Um, in any of those um, Kafka topics, do you end up putting effectively, does the whole database ever end up of, of the source system, at least with regards to the subset that you care about that's gonna find its way into solar, does it, ever, does it all ever end up effectively in one of those Kafka um, topics? I mean, it, it wouldn't be necessary for incremental, but over time, um, do you size it so that, because you mentioned the cold, this is related to the cold start problem. How do you kind of start from scratch? I've, I've related, um, before you answer, I've played with once with um, Kafka and uh, um, it, it, it's typical to use it for streaming over say an X amount of time or, or with this bounded amount of data, but for lots and lots of data, uh, I found it's possible to use Kafka 
to effectively store the data, um, long-term archival, if you, if you use it in the right way. I'm not sure if you tried that. Yeah, so this is exactly the problem we face, that um, the way the Kafka, uh, the way the solutions are described in Kafka uh, website, uh, Confirm website, they say that you can just create a change event from the table, uh, and if you try to do that, you essentially end up loading all the data into your Kafka queue, and in some cases, you probably don't need all of the data, uh, but it really depends on how much your Kafka uh, infrastructure can support, because depending on the kind of uh, uh, deletion policies and the cleanup policies you have on your Kafka, uh, uh, sometimes it is possible. Uh, so it's really just making a case with the infrastructure. But right now, we are not sort of asking them to store everything in Kafka for database. Uh, so instead, uh, in the beginning, what we have done is sort of create a shortcut. Like we, in the application platform, Siphon, we run the stored procedure directly on the database uh, for the cold start, and we run the, the data directly from database into our cache, but the incremental will come through Kafka. Okay. Uh, but I think uh, you know, over the time, that because the database fresh refresh uh, takes its own time to finish because the database is still loaded. Uh, so I think uh, the going forward, our plan is to sort of uh, uh, have enough uh, a dedicated Kafka cluster to sort of manage all this uh, mechanism so that we can expand the storage uh, requirement. And once you get all your data into Kafka, then next time when you have to do the full load, you basically just replay all the traffic, uh, sorry, all the all the messages from the beginning. And that means uh, now your cache is just up to date within like much like maybe one fifth, uh, sorry, like 5% of the time that it would take for a stored procedure. Okay, thanks. I have another question. I'm just curious, um, 200 fields on a document and 5,000 to 10,000 document updates per second. Have you profiled your network? I mean, that's a lot of bandwidth potentially. Or have so you profiled this, Solar to see where your, your, you know, your, your issues are lying right now? So this throughput was not the application's output. The application can output at much higher rate. Uh, this is the throughput of uh, the throughput of writing the document into Solar Cluster uh, for a one particular collection. We have like hundreds, uh, like hundreds of collections. Uh, so uh, since the Solar Cluster that we are writing data to uh, can also be serving traffic, uh, so we we actually thought that 2.5 looks uh, initially we, we thought that 2.5 looks really bad, but we we even had like a, the Solar Fallover when it went beyond that. So it really depends on um, how, how big is your, uh, the collection, how many replicas, and uh, since we have too many collections, sometimes the, the nodes have more than one collection. And let's say if you are serving traffic to like writing data into a smaller collection, but the larger collection is receiving more incoming search traffic. So uh, if the node is just doing too much, uh, it, it is data, data, data ingestion capacity reduces. Uh, but it's just a function of uh, how much solar can take. Uh, it's not the uh, limitation on these, the application itself. Okay, so you don't think it has anything to do with network bandwidth? No, no, no. Okay. One more. So uh, I was thinking back to the atomic updates of the solar feature. Um, have you tried um, in-place updates, at least for the cases where you can use that feature? Like maybe price could fit into that category. Um, I know that the in-place updates feature has certain limitations, but um, you, maybe you could do that for some things, but not others. Well, you can try to do it for stored fields, but when you write the document back, is, is that what you're saying? No, it's in, no, it's in-place updates. This is a, a new, um, ever since I don't know, seven something or six something actually, um, you can update a numeric field um, if it has doc values only, and it does not require a reindex of the entire document. Only that numeric field is updated, and it's mostly useful for um, relevancy tw tweaks like uh, clicks and stuff like that. Um, you can't search on the well. You you can and you can't. Um, I guess you haven't explored it. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I haven't read about it much, but I know I have read about at, at least that that this feature exists in Solar, uh, and I. I, I, we don't use doc values yet. Uh, we, we tried using it, but we kind of saw degraded performance. Uh, so 
uh, it's maybe just the nature of our queries and data. Uh, we can talk about it after the session because we really wanted to find out that everyone says doc values are cool, but why it doesn't work for us. Okay. Uh, and that's why maybe that. we didn't look at this option. Okay. One more? I think this is the last question today. And if you have more questions, uh, feel free to grab me after this. Thank you for the talk. Um, what is the retention policy of the events in Kafka? Do you store them indefinitely, or do you uh, purge them after? And so we don't idea? have any custom policy yet. Like we just go by whatever the uh, the other teams in Kafka uh, cluster are using, uh, because right now we are not wholeheartedly storing everything on Kafka. We only sort of care about recent events. Uh, but going forward, when we start storing using Kafka as a storage so that we can replay from Kafka without having to go database, that's when we'll start of, uh, asking questions about we, uh, how, what we need to do to increase the retention. Uh, I think it is like two days. Uh, I don't know what's the default for Kafka. One week? Yeah, so that's what we have. Okay. Yeah, thank you guys for coming. Uh, uh, before we forget, like I really wanted to thank uh, all the such tech team members who, who actually volunteered to help with every step. You may have seen them in Wayfair t-shirts uh, along the way. Uh, so can we have like one round of applause for them, please? Thank you, and have a good night.